It's my pleasure to introduce Maria Hernandez, uh, the Senior Vice President of Strategic Development for Modernizing Medicine. By the end of the evening, you will understand what modernizing medicine is and why it's so important um, nationally, but also to us at FAU. Um, she's responsible for leading strategic partnerships and alliances at this company, which still goes under the umbrella of a startup, even though it's, it's very started up. Um, it's revolutionizing healthcare through its innovative electronic medical record system, um, which intersects cloud, data, and mobile to uh, transform the way information is gathered and communicated back um, to doctors in certain specialties. Um, and you will see um, how they do it. It's a very, very interesting um, process. Um, prior to joining Modernizing Medicine, um, Maria was the Chief Innovation Officer for IBM, where she was a visionary leader and evangelist in driving, that's, that's what I do in my department, in driving innovation with IBM's largest strategic outsourcing clients in Latin America, opening new doors to business and increasing client satisfaction through innovative technologies and solutions. Um, I'm not going to read all of her background because it's just, it's long, but you need to know that um, she was responsible for the development of IBM's cloud uh, computing um, as a game changer with their business partners. And IBM has always worked in, with the concept of business partners rather than you are our client. Um, That's good. That's good? <laughs> okay. Um, she expanded her role into the entrepreneurial eco ecosystem by large, launching Startup Florida as the fifth state to be part of the Startup America National Joanne? Initiative, which brings Where together the private sector, incubators, investors, um, and other organizations to support so entrepreneurs who leverage technology to drive okay. innovation. Um, some of you probably know we have on this campus at this point in time something called Tech Runway. Um, it is modernizing medicine was, uh, they go off on their own. Um, so with no more ado, put your hands together <laughs> and welcome Maria um, Hernandez from Modernizing Medicine. And it's, by the way, it's my pet company. It's, it's, it's a pet company of mine. I follow it. So um, I am extraordinarily interested. Great. Um, and having a speaker come to us again, once again, from Modernizing Medicine. It's right okay. down here on Glades Road, by the Yeah, way. you're just in our backyard. Can you guys hear me? I'm not sure if yeah, any of these gadgets are working. Okay, let me see if this, I can get this one to work. Are you turning it on? Yeah, if I press that and... It was all charged up. All right, let's see. Huh? Mm. Do we have to do the microphones on that? this one and how about the other camera one is that good okay well thank you so much for for the great intro and just delighted to to be here tonight this is my second year doing this so I really do enjoy coming back um, and talking to to students I'm now right here at modernizing medicine which is one of the companies in the corporate park so it took me literally five minutes to get here so which I probably could have walked but not when the rain is coming so, um, so yes, last year when I was here, um, I was still with IBM. I joined Modernizing Medicine in March of this year. I had actually been working with Modernizing Medicine for about um, a year to a year and a half prior to joining because as my bio says, um, IBM does a lot of work with business partners and other companies 
So Modernizing Medicine was one of the companies that I was working with around um, the Watson technology, and I'll talk about that in just a second, uh, which is all about uh, cognitive computing and how that's being used um, in the real industry, such as healthcare. So, um, so it was just an, an, an interesting sort of set of events, started working with them, and it just made sense um, for me to come over and lead their strategic um, development team. So really excited tonight to kind of take you through a little bit about modernizing medicine. Um, then I'll go through, since this is a, a business class, I was asked to kind of put out there some of the things, I call it, you know, what keeps me up at night list. Um, some of the things that I'm, I'm sort of dealing with in my new role, right? And I think it will give you some food for thought as what leaders like myself uh, in companies um, like modernizing medicine are having to deal with. So maybe we'll give you some ideas as, you know, being business students, you know, this is what happens in real life. Um, let's see, anything else on my background? Um, with IBM, I was basically there for over 20 years. I did just about everything except, I like to say, except be in legal and in finance. So I was in development, marketing, consulting. I ended up even in IBM research. Uh, which was just an amazing opportunity to see, you know, what the scientists are working on for, you know, what's to come in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. So that was an exciting uh, assignment. And then um, my last one as Chief Innovation Officer for Latin America, again, just really working on bleeding edge type of technologies and how to apply those uh, to clients, to industries, which at the end of the day, that's really what the value is, right? You, you can't just develop technology for the sake of developing technology. You have to be able to apply it to a real business problem. So, um, so I'll go through this and I'll leave enough time for, for Q&A so, um, you know, if you can hold your questions until the end. So who is, you know, what is or who is modernizing medicine? Uh, this is really our mission. Uh, it's all about transforming, and I would say it's really disrupting um, the healthcare industry, and you'll see some of the things that we're doing. Uh, but it's really all about information, right? We keep hearing about data and how much is growing and big data and all of that. Um, you know, there's so much about what we do that is tied to data. Um, so it's all about creating that data, consuming it, and utilizing it um, in the healthcare industry to increase efficiencies and improve outcomes. A little bit about um, the founders of Modernizing Medicine. Um, Dan, uh, technology entrepreneur, he also sits on the board of, um, of FAU. And he was the co-founder of Blackboard. Um, many of you probably use Blackboard today. And, um, and he took that company, uh, company public back in uh, 2003 and then sold in 2010 uh, for $1.6 billion. So a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, Co-founder, Dr. Michael Sherling, uh, he's a practicing dermatologist. As you can see here, very accomplished, um, you know, Yale, Harvard, um, and, uh, you know, it was interesting the way that they, they both met. Uh, Dan actually went to, you know, go for his annual, you know, checkup, skin checkup with uh, Michael Sherling, and they were talking about, you know, just how, um, you know, how healthcare is still so much, you know, did you, you know, behind, sort of behind the times from a technology perspective. And then that conversation led to them, you know, founding Modernizing Medicine. So, so just an interesting set of events on how they met and, and where they are today. So that was back in 2010. Um, we are five years old, so we're sort of really out of startup mode, but uh, very much, you know, the culture and just the innovation um, that happens in the company is still very much, you know, a startup. Uh, this is us. Um, right now, we're actually uh, going to be over 400 employees because we just made an acquisition, uh, which will close next week, and it will put us around 430 employees. Uh, we acquired a company uh, in the gastroenterology space, um, so they also have an EHR. They're one of the top uh, or the top gastroenterology company for EHRs, so um, they will be part of our team. And we have locations um, here in Boca, in Roseville, 
uh, because uh, Roseville, California, we had made an acquisition back in December around um, revenue cycle management and we have, and now with GMED, which is the company that we are acquiring, we will be in Weston, um, uh, the Carolinas, the Carolinas and Chile. So uh, we're going to have several locations now. So this is part of growing, right? You're going to have multiple locations to, to manage. One of the unique things about modernizing medicine is that we actually have doctors on staff that work for us. Um, so we call them cyber stars. And they are practicing physicians. They come in, you know, two or three times um, a week. And they actually help us code. They know the workflow uh, of what happens when a patient comes into the examining room. So they help us, you know, design the workflow, actually code um, how the application will look for, for the doctors that will use it. So there's nothing like getting it directly from them because usually the, the way it's done is, you know, a doctor gives the requirements to the programmer, the programmer then um, develops the code, and then by the time it gets back to the doctor, it's probably something different than what they originally intended. So we're going directly to the source. Uh, and again, we have them for all special, for the eight specialties that, um, that we cover. Uh, really proud of um, some of the accomplishments that we have received back last year. We were uh, one of the 10 companies revolutionizing entrepreneurship. And you'll see the list here. Uh, Tesla Motors was number one, uh, and we were number two. And then here's some of the, the others on the top 10 list. So really, you know, it was great to see that we're in great company with some of these um, firms like Uber and, and others, Airbnb, that are really revolutionizing um, you know, their space or their industry. Uh, we also received uh, recognition from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, last year we received the leadership in healthcare. So again, um, not just in entrepreneurship, but we're being recognized for what we're doing in healthcare. So let me tell you a little bit about um, our product. Um, so we are primarily an electronic uh, medical record for um, surgical specialties such as dermatology, gastroenterology, um, ENT, and, you, and I'll show you all the eight that we cover. Um, but basically, you know, we provide a native iPad application that adapts to what the doctor's workflow might be. And um, we also have a web version, but very much is on an iPad, so that has the mobile component to it, so the doctor, you know, can be in in the examining room and be able to look at the patient and not be kind of typing away um, at the keyboard using a, a web base. I mean, they can certainly do that, but the mobile um, iPad just gives them the ability to, to talk to the patients and be looking at them in the eye while they're, they're selecting, um, you know, the different <coughs> aspects of, of the visit. Um, we also have, um, you know, some mobile, you know, on, you know, we have it on the iPhone, so doctors can, you know, when they're away or at the, uh, moving around, they can also use that. And we're in the process of developing an iWatch um, version of Emma with certain functionality being available on the iWatch. In addition to our EMR, or electronic medical record, um, we also have other products and services that uh, just complement uh, what we do in the examining room. So, you know, things like billing, like inventory management, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other products and services around uh, some of the, you know, government sort of dictated, you know, uh, governance types of things that we need, doctors need to provide, you know, PQRS, meaningful use. So this is just to improve uh, the efficiency and efficacy of healthcare. Now here are the specialties. Um, dermatology is the one that we first started with back in 2011. So right now we have about, you know, close to 5,000 providers, so 30% of, of the market. Um, next we have ophthalmology. This one is, you know, second oldest, 2013, and we're about probably around 1,000. This chart is a couple of months old. Um, so we're growing there. These are the other three that were launched last year. So we have plastic surgery, orthopedics, uh, and ENT. And these are, you know, continuing to build. 
Uh, and then we have the last here, well, GI, we just made the acquisition, as I mentioned, urology and rheumatology we call our baby Emmas because they're up and coming, they're still under development. This talks a little bit about um, the number of users that we have. So as you can see here, we're right now just in the U.S. Uh, we have about, you know, close to 48,000 users, um, you know, 33 million patient encounters, uh, and then 42 million patient uh, counts. So, uh, and you will see here, we will be expanding internationally. So uh, that's one of the things actually that I will be driving in my new role. Now talk a little bit about the technology. So, um, so modernizing medicine is, is really in, in three big areas that are, are just up and coming and, and changing the, the IT industry as we see it today. Um, cloud, uh, mobile, and data. So we are really at the intersection of those three and I'll talk a little bit more about this. So from a cloud perspective, we were what we consider a born on the cloud type of company. Um, so we, you know, everything is done on the cloud. The doctors, uh, uh, you know, it allows them the flexibility to do work from anywhere. Um, it scales um, really well so that, you know, if we have to go into a doctor's practice, um, a private practice, and then go to a hospital, if that's another one of our clients, we can scale very easily. Um, so that's really the advantage of cloud. Uh, for us. Uh, on the mobile side, again, you have the, the ability for the doctor to move around, take the iPad, take the, the, uh, the iPhone. Um, and uh, the nice thing about mobile is that it adapts, as you'll see. Um, with the iPad, it adapts to the doctor's way of, of seeing patients and the way that they do their workflow. Uh, from a big data perspective, we're collecting all of this data that the doctors are, as they see patients and they code different diseases and diagnosis and so forth, all of that data is being collected so that we can, you know, analyze things such as, um, you know, which medications for a particular disease are being prescribed the most. Uh, you know, we can do that type of data, which is, you know, extremely important, right? Uh, I mean, for example, we're having conversations with the pharmaceutical companies around, obviously they want to know which of, you know, the, um, the drugs are, you know, having most success with doctors so we can provide, you know, actually sell some of that data uh, to them around, you know, what are doctors using. Um, so, so that's extremely valuable information for them that they're willing to, um, to pay for. So let me talk a little bit about um, Schema. Schema is um, the powered by IBM Watson uh, capability that we have within EMMA. And as I said earlier, because of my involvement and the fact that Modernizing Medicine became an IBM uh, ecosystem partner, uh, that allowed them to develop, you know, Watson into or include Watson into the EMR application. So what this, you know, Watson allows the doctor to do is that if they're in the examining room and the doctor has a question about uh, the diagnosis or what he, may, he or she may be prescribing to this patient uh, and just wants to refer to an article or ask a question, you can actually ask Watson right from the examining room, ask, the doctor can ask a question of Watson and then Watson will go to you know, medical journals, textbooks, whatever information is out there, it will come back with an answer. And normally doctors do this, but they do it after work, um, and it's not something they can do right there with the patient in front of them. It can also be very specific. So for example, if the doctor is uh, diagnosing, let's say, psoriasis for a 35-year-old male, um, you know, with diabetes, you know, it can ask a question in that context. So it's not, a search engine per se, it's really, you know, it's got that intelligence to it that it can be, the question can be asked pertaining to the particular patient that you have in the room. So it can search the information for psoriasis, 35 year old male with diabetes. So, um, so that's really all about this idea of cognitive computing. Um, the doctor can dictate, you know, in natural language, um, can ask the question or they can select the question or type it in, but you know, Watson does understand it's a natural language uh, processor as well. Um, 
the other thing that came along with this Watson partnership with IBM, actually IBM ended up funding um, modernizing medicine, so, um, so now we have an even tighter partnership uh, to get you know, our application with Watson out in the marketplace. This is an example of um, you know, some of the questions that you can ask Watson. Um, so as you can see, some of these um, you know, can be very specific. The last one, what therapies can I use on psoriasis patients who are pregnant, right? So, so very specific. Again, if you go out to Google and do something like this, you get you know, 20, 30 articles to read. This kind of pinpoints exactly the answer. Um, and then you can read more about it, but it's a little more precise. And then Watson comes back in this case, um, you know, with a confidence level because, you know, Watson is not going to replace the doctor, obviously. You know, the doctor will always have the ultimate decision, but, you know, here's, you know, the machine, right, trying to compliment the doctor, give him that reassurance uh, that this information is, you know, what was found and they can then decide the best treatment for the, for the patient. Um, so this is still, um, this is still under development. Um, so we are training Watson. It has to, you know, Watson doesn't come already trained on healthcare. So one of the big projects that I've been leading is around, you know, training Watson with all the medical journals, you know, and of all the things that you train a machine, you know, to, to work on, you know, healthcare is like the worst, <laughs> the most complicated one. Um, just because of all the terminologies and all the nuances of, of that. So, um, and I don't know how many of you, um, IBM had uh, Watson as, uh, doing a Jeopardy game back, uh, I guess, two or three years ago. So it does very well in that type of setting. Now this is sort of the next frontier, having it, you know, understand, you know, medical data. So a lot of the work um, that we're doing in a couple of projects that we're working on is around, you know, training Watson to understand, you know, to read a medical textbook, to understand the, you know, the journals that are being written, and then, you know, try to pull all that together. So when the questions that are asked, it knows where to go and, and how to respond, you know, accurately. Um, so this is just another example of Watson. Um, what's in the works here, as I mentioned earlier, the iWatch. Uh, this is one of the other innovation projects that uh, we're looking at and, um, you know, we're piloting. The other one is telemedicine. So again, in healthcare, telemedicine is, is a big, um, you know, a, a big disruptor. And in this case, what we're looking at is for patients, not necessarily just for for anybody to say, oh, you know, I have a rash, can somebody diagnose it? Um, this is the way that we're implementing it. It will be, you know, you have your doctor, if you have a rash or something that you would like to, to take a picture of and send to your doctor to, to analyze, we can do it through here, uh, through this um, telemedicine application. So that, again, something that um, we're working on and will be available shortly. Um, I threw this in, so I'm, that, that was sort of the, you know, very quick sort of general um, introduction to modernizing medicine. What I thought I'd uh, start to give you an idea now uh, around some of the things as I came on board. So here I come with a lot of enterprise experience being with IBM and, and you know, IBM obviously is all about big enterprise clients, right? So I used to work with a lot of the banks, the retailers. Um, so as companies grow, and you know, modernizing medicine is growing exponentially, you know, you deal with um, you know, lots, lots of challenges around how are you gonna grow? Because you, you know, sometimes growth is great, but you have to do it in a, in a way that you're, it doesn't turn into chaos. So one of the first things that I did coming on board under, um, for modernizing medicine is really do a client segmentation, and I don't know Again, if in your classes or if, if you're already out in the workforce, um, how much of this you do. But this was key to align all of us within the company to understand, for example, you know, we are going to move into the enterprise space, but enterprise means different things to different people. Enterprise means large companies. Enterprise means hospitals. Enterprise could mean a large practice, you know, maybe 20 or more doctors or 30 more doctors. So um, I want to move into sort of, you know, this is, 
what I do day to day, right? These are the kind of things that I, I, I work on with my team. These are the kind of things that I report to, to Dan, the CEO, and, um, and Dr. Sherling and the management team. Um, and this was one, a piece of work that very important to position us and be clear about you know, who our customers really are. And as you can see here, we kind of, you know, did a size, uh, you know, size of client, and then whether it's core or emerging. For modernizing medicine for the last five years, they've basically been in the large private practice and private practice space. Obviously, they started down here in the private practice space. Um, we moved to large private practice. Um, so that's sort of our bread and butter. But, you know, as we look at market data, um, there's a lot of consolidation, you know, doctors, are, you know, single, you know, one or two doctor practices are consolidating into bigger practices. Bigger practices are being acquired by hospitals and becoming part of hospital systems. So, um, so we're seeing sort of this, this uh, migration and, and it doesn't mean that the private practice space is going to go away, but, you know, we are seeing again more hospitals. Um, academic institutions, you know, looking at a solution like ours uh, that's, again, very innovative. Um, and also, we have this multi-specialty where you have multiple doctors from different specialties practicing all under the same roof. So this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the type of work that we have to be very clear on within the company so that when we say, in my case, when we talk about, you know, I have to develop my enterprise strategy, you know, I have to be sure that everybody in the company understands what I mean by enterprise. Um, and I just, with this new acquisition that uh, we just made, guess what, yesterday that was the discussion. You know, what does enterprise mean to them? What does enterprise mean to us? Because it was different. So for them, it was slightly different. Um, they do more in the, uh, more in the, because they're gastro, they do, um, more of the ASCs, the ambulatory surgical centers, uh, versus the true, you know, big hospitals. Um, so, so these are the kinds of things, again, that this is what I do, right? A lot of people say, well, what does strategic development mean? Uh, it's a lot of positioning, a lot of looking at, you know, how are we going to position ourselves? What are some of the strategic opportunities that we can um, start to look at? Uh, who are some of the partners that we're going to do it with or, you know, major uh, partners or strategic partners that we'll, uh, we'll be partnering with. And it starts with this, right, because this is very clear um, for, for all of us working on uh, in the company as to where we're headed. All right, so, um, so this is sort of my, you know, what keeps me up at night list. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a lot of other things, but these, I think, are, are the top three. And, and again, food for thought for all of you as, you know, as business students. Um, so managing innovation. I mean, I touched upon, um, you know, Watson. I mean, talk about, you know, bleeding edge kinds of technologies and, that are coming in to the market. Um, so, you know, innovation, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's, it's a lot about generating ideas and just putting those ideas into motion. Um, you know, the other sort of challenge with innovation is that you really need to manage innovation. Otherwise, it's just a lot of generation of ideas that really don't get, um, you know, into implementation or into the market. So, um, you know, a lot of what I do is, you know, we do look at, you know, what are the next big things? Um, how do we, you know, which ones do we select? Which ones do we spend time on? You know, what's the return on investment? Um, so it's, even though a lot of things sound like really cool to do, we can't take, you know, there are limits to what we can take on uh, from a, you know, business model, you know, cost perspective. So, so this is something that I, you know, again, having sort of this strategic role within the company, I have to think about, uh, you know, which ones are we going to select? You know, how the ones that we select, how are, th how are we going to take them through what I call the funnel of innovation? You know, how do you take it to, from technology to incubation to actual, you know, getting it out in the market and implemented. And Watson is a perfect example of that. Uh, so we're still uh, very much in, you know, we've decided that's the way we're going to go from a cognitive computing perspective. Now we're in pilot stage, um, you know, working with a potential client. So it's kind of going through the stages. 
Um, but it's, again, it's easier said than done. When you talk about innovation, there is a process, there is, you know, thought behind, beyond the idea, if, even if it's a great idea, there's a lot of business, um, you know, ROI type of uh, considerations. Uh, the other thing is, as I mentioned, uh, around enterprise strategy, uh, you know, how do we move, you know, how do you move a company that has primarily been in the private practice space into the hospitals? You know, what's their readiness? How do you support an enterprise client? It's not just about, um, you know, you can't just show up to a hospital and say, here's this great, you know, EMR solution. You know, how do we, how do we engage with the hospitals? Uh, you know, we find that, and we actually have, a couple of enterprise clients um, already in motion. And I mean, the doctors love it, right? The doctors just love the technology. They, f you know, they're so, you know, so much more efficient in seeing patients. They can see more patients. Uh, and, the doctor and the hospitals love that, right? Because if, if doctors can see more patients, then that's generating more revenue for the hospital. Uh, and usually the surgical specialties like dermatology and some of these others, you know, are the big revenue generating um, speci specialties in the hospital. So, um, so the doctors love it, but then you have to deal with the IT department, right? So the IT department is the one that has to go implement it and get it integrated and all of that. So that's a whole aspect that of, of this, you know, enterprise process that we have to, you know, kind of understand and make sure we're ready to deliver. So the fact that we're on cloud, you know, um, some hospitals are, are still not moving into the cloud space, so this is a difficult sort of concept for them, and they're and, and you know they're fearful of you know security concerns and other things around you know moving into the cloud space. Um, so that is something that you know from an enterprise strategy perspective, I got to think about. So it's not just about here, you know, here's this great technology that doctors can use, but how is this technology going to integrate into their overall you know infrastructure? Um, you know, it's not, you know, hospitals have a lot more doctors than a private practice, obviously, so you have to worry about things like, well, if you're training and supporting maybe a three-doctor practice, and that goes pretty well, and it's, you know, straightforward, when you're dealing with a hospital where there could be, you know, hundreds of doctors, you know, how do you train hundreds of doctors? How do you deal with, you know, if they have questions or issues? Um, so we're looking at enterprise strategy um, from all aspects, not just from, uh, from just getting the technology out there, but what are the implications in being in the, the enterprise space from a support um, and partnership perspective. Um, and then international expansion, this is, you know, the other big frontier for us. So we've done a terrific job and we're still growing in the U.S. and we want to continue to do that. But again, I'm tasked to kind of think you know, further out, so international expansion is something that's, you know, on my radar screen right now. So similar to enterprise strategy, it's the same kind of thing. You can't just show up to a country and say, you know, I'm open, up for, I'm open for business, right? Uh, even if we go after the English-speaking countries, because right now, Emma, which is, um, I, I think I may ha not have mentioned that, that's the name of our solution, electronic medical assistant. Um, Emma is not available in other languages today, so we could go after, you know, the English-speaking countries, you know, Australia, the UK, um, so, so that, that is something that I'm in the process of thinking through, you know, which countries, what's our global strategy, um, how do we resell our product, because um, for us to open up offices in these countries is very expensive, it's very complicated from a legal perspective. So, so we're looking at partnerships, you know, how can we partner with someone that's there so that, you know, they can resell for us and hopefully support and do all the implementation so we don't have to do it from here because then you get into time zone issues. Um, so, so again, this is very complicated and again, when I was with IBM, it was, you know, IBM is 170 countries today so that, you know, it was easy to go into each country and you, you do what you got to do but I'm now on the other side having to take a new company that has not been established internationally, uh, you know, and thinking about, you know, what are all the, you know, the ins and outs of doing that and uh, from a legal perspective, from a reselling and channel perspective, um, you know, so lots of, you know, and the other thing that gets very interesting with, 
with healthcare and and doing healthcare internationally is that um, you know each country has you know different laws and policies around um, healthcare information, just like we have here around you know personal health information (PHI). So some countries, um, actually most countries, do not allow you to take data out of the country. So you have to keep everything in within the country. So for us, that has implications because if you remember what I mentioned earlier, yes, we are an EMR system, an application, but we also capture so much data because, again, data is king. So, you know, what do we do with this data that's outside of the country? You know, how do we bring it back? How do we de-identify it so that we can still use it for, you know, for the analysis that, that we're, we're doing? So, um, you know, again, just this is the kind of stuff I do day to day and think about. You know, how are we going to do this in an orderly fashion? Um, you know, not make any mistakes and and hopefully be successful as we undertake, you know, our rollout um, at the international level. So I think I'm going to stop there um, and just give you a chance to to ask some questions. I kind of wanted just to throw out you know, some, some ideas and, and hopefully spur some, some questions and some good conversation. So any questions? Yes. So we're, because we're on the cloud, oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, how do we manage licenses? Um, so the way we do that, because we're on the cloud, so we are subscription model, um, so you know, doctors pay a monthly fee for uh, for our access to our application. Yes. So they have to use their own iPads and iPhones. <coughs> so the question is, do they have to use their own iPads and iPhones? Yes. So uh, I mean, we can certainly you know purchase it for them and kind of give them a a bundle. But you know, they a lot of them already have iPads, or they can just go and and purchase the iPads. Yes. Um, you guys integrate with the practices with revenue management and everything else, and you guys use EMRs or EHRs or both? Um, so the question is, do we use EMRs or EHRs or both? Yeah. So, um, so to to me, the distinction is, you know, what we do is is more at the at the doctor level, you know, at the especially at the specialty level. So when we go into, and I'll give you the hospital um, space, you know, when we go into a hospital, we are a front end to the, the system of record or the EMR of record for the hospital. So we integrate with that. Um, so I think the EHR, EMR, you know, I think that today may be used interchangeably. Um, but to us, you know, we are the health record for that patient. Uh, and then when it comes to a hospital space, we integrate into the overall medical, you know, system that's at the hospital. Like they need to be at stage two compliance or something like that. <coughs> government. Compliance. Yeah. So all the government. Uh, so the question was, they need to be stage two compliant, which is all, you know, part of the government regulations. So yes, we we follow that as well, okay. uh, and we provide that capability to the doctors because it is becoming because of all the changes with you know, Obamacare and all of that, it is becoming much more difficult for doctors, um, you know, to track, you know, all of the, you know, the, you know, the governance type of things that they're going to have to report on uh, because now it's much more about, you know, evidence-based medicine and not so much, you know, pay for, you know, just for going in to see the doctor. It's all about, you know, is the patient getting well? You know, what did you, what did you see them for, you know, so it's a lot more of, of that type of knowledge that they need to report on. <coughs> yes? Um, what are your most important co medical clients right now in the United States or in other countries? What are the most important? Cost medical clients. Oh, clients. So what are the most important clients? Um, so, I mean, clients... So th the clients that we have right now, so most of, as I mentioned, as I showed in that chart, most of our clients are in the private space. So they're small to large private practices. Um, so anywhere, you know, two or three doctors up to like 20 doctors or so. Um, and then we're moving into the enterprise space. So um, I'll mention a couple of the clients that we have today. We have Krieger Eye Institute, which is 
um, up in the Maryland area. So that's a, an enterprise client for us. They're part of a big hospital system. Uh, we have Emory, you know, which is you know medical institution within an academic setting. So they're also you know a big client of ours. Uh, but that's on the enterprise space. On the um, private space, I mean, as you saw, we have you know in dermatology we have you know 5,000 providers. Those are doctors uh, in the U.S. Yes, the question. The data you have is from uh, 2010, or you have access to data that is pre-existent? Um, so the question is, the data that we have, is it from 2010? Okay. Or, yeah, so we started collecting the data from day one. So we have all of that, you know, historical data that we can draw upon as to, you know, no, not prior. We don't have access to anything prior to 2010. There was really no way to capture it. So we're not importing any of that data. It's just what we're capturing because the EMR captures everything is structured data. So that's why we can do all this analysis. And I don't want to get too technical, but um, that's what allows us to do the analysis. All structure, the way the workflow is done within the application allows you to capture and then analyze that in a very easy way. Yes, sorry. <laughs> How was uh, your transition going from IBM of 20 years to a startup that you had been with, you know, maybe 18 months or so? We've only been there five, five months. Okay. <laughs> so well, great. Of them with IBM. Right, right. So great question. So how's the transition uh, from, you know, from an IBM to, you know, to a startup company? So that's a great question because I get asked that a lot. <laughs> and um, so I will say, I mean, you know, I was on what I call an intrapreneur within IBM. So I was always, I would say mostly in the last 10 to 15 years, um, just in, in new spaces, right? I, I would, you know, I ended up in research. I ended up in the internet division back, you know, in the 90s. I was sent to uh, Central America to turn around that territory and introduce um, some new products. Um, I was, you know, so I was doing a lot of, uh, I kind of branded myself very much as, you know, an entrepreneur in a big corporation. So, you know, that's who they called upon, you know, new product, go San Maria there, you know, new um, market, go San Maria. So that was, I was very much, you know, an entrepreneur. So I think that really helped me then sort of be on the other side once I decided to leave IBM uh, because it just, you know, I was used to, you know, dynam you know, things changing and being very dynamic, um, you know, just dealing with, you know, the culture, right, that it's, it's just, um, again, just very innovative and, you know, things change really quickly. So a lot of that, you know, helped me. It still was a, a transition. I mean, I'm not saying, it, you know, it was without any adjustments, but it, it kind of flowed from what I was doing um, to what I'm doing, what I'm doing now. And I, kid, I still get to do enterprise stuff, which is what I was brought in to do anyways, which is all around, you know, how do we get into the big hospitals, uh, into the big academic institutions. So whether you're at a bank, hospital, you know, university, there's a lot of similarities in the way that you, you know, that you talk and establish, you know, you establish relationships with those clients. Great question. Let me go this side of the room for a bit. Great question. So what type of experience um, helped me work in, it's sort of in strategy and helped me kind of be on that path? So I would say, um, you know, in particular, you know, I've, in addition to being very entrepreneur, I've been a visionary all along. So I'm one of those people that can see beyond what's today. And one of the areas with or one of the roles that I had within IBM that really helped me kind of look beyond, you know, really beyond was really being in IBM research uh, because I really got to see, you know, what these scientists are working on and then part of my role was, you know, okay, now that you're seeing what they're working on, you know, start thinking about what this means to, to the market, right? How do we bring it to market? How do we identify a problem that we can solve with this technology? Um, and I'll give you a good example. I mean, when I was at IBM Research, um, 
you know, this whole natural language, you know, how do you talk to computers? I mean, that's been a project that IBM has undertaken for, I don't know, 30 years or more. I mean, it's just ongoing. You know, we will get to the point that, you know, we will talk to computers just like, you know, we talk to each other, right? We're not there yet, but it's been in the works for forever. Uh, and it's just one of these long term, and I, you know, was side by side with a lot of the scientists <coughs> that have dedicated their lives to, you know, this, you know, th these types of projects. Um, so I was asked to, and this is always interesting, um, and this was back, I guess, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago. You know, back then, cars, you know, not like they are today where you can, you know, say, turn on the radio, you know, you can actually talk and have voice in the car. You didn't have that, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I was asked as part of the research that we were doing, and again, IBM has clients like, you know, Ford, all the major automotive companies, um, to actually sit in a car to test the natural language, you know, project um, or application that they were working on. And it was interesting, they needed a woman's voice because of the pitch that women have. They, you know, this, the, the experiment they were trying to do is, you know, make sure that the machine understands a woman's voice. And also that understands accents. So I have a little bit of an accent. Um, so have the computer kind of start listening to that so it can learn, it can start to differentiate, you know, when somebody has an accent or when they have a different pitch. Um, so I, you know, that's the kind of thing that I was asked to do, you know, sit in a car, read a script, you know, let the computer hear and learn from, you know, my voice. Um, so back then I was like, really, this is not going to go anywhere, right? <laughs> it just, uh, but look at today, right? I mean, so much is driven by voice. I mean, look at Siri, look at, I mean, how many other things are driven by voice? Um, and so, the, so these are the kind of things I think seeing what the future, you know, has in store for us and then kind of bringing it back to, you know, what does that mean and how do we start to put that in motion and how do we solve a problem? Um, so I think it did open my eyes to really, you know, be able to see technology for, you know, for what it could be, you know, sort of, um, you know, the art of the possible. And I think that starts to open up your mind, um, you know, to think really outside the box. Yes. Okay, so uh, the question is, we have different client segments. Who do we consider to be the competition? So we are considered a third generation EHR, meaning that we are really pretty unique in the market when it comes to being an EHR that's on cloud, mobile, and it's <coughs> capturing all this data. There's really not that many companies out there. We do have competitors um, that do something similar, but you know, the reason we've gotten so many awards and we're getting you know, investments and all of that is because we are sort of leading the pack, right? Uh, and that's why we're growing so fast because people are seeing that, boy, we're, we're really out there leading. Um, but we do have some competitors that are, you know, are, are cloud or are mobile. Um, but we seem to sort of be in that, as I showed, you know, sort of in the middle of those three big strategic areas that are coming together in the industry. Yes. So the question is, uh, what tips or ideas do I have for marketing new products or ideas? Um, so I would say, you know, you have to know who your, your clients are. That's why I kind of started with this chart that I showed earlier because, you know, sometimes, again, you get sort of so caught up in the, um, you know, let, let's get this product to market and let's put all the messaging around it and then it flops, right? But that's because you didn't really have you know, a clear understanding of who your client was. So that's why, I, I mean, I did it for other reasons, um, not so much from a marketing perspective, but, but that's, in my other experiences with marketing, you have to be, you know, very clear about who your clients are. Um, so that's definitely, you know, one of, one of the areas that I would recommend, you know, doing, <coughs> you know, really understanding what that is. And that's working, you know, with your marketing team, with your, um, you know, if you have any somebody on the team uh, that can do some market research, you know, so it's not just one person that would <coughs> help you with that, but it it probably be a cross-company type of undertaking. 
Yes, back there. Um, great question. So are we planning to do radiology um, since it's already on the iPad? So we actually do imaging. So for example, dermatologists, if you go see them in the office and they're using Emma, you know, they can take pictures of your rash and, you know, if you have surgery or biopsies or whatever, they take pictures of that. So we already are taking, you know, that's part of the electronic medical record uh, for you know, for the patient, you know, the pictures, um, you know, lab results, you know, lab, you know, blood work, pathology, you know, type of reports. So that is all part of Emma and we integrate it, we keep the pictures within the record so that the doctor can refer back and do comparisons. Um, so we don't have an Emma for radiology, but we do take the images, um, you know, not so much the x-rays uh, today, but that is something actually that I am looking at. How do we get more into like the MRIs, the, and now that we're getting into hospitals and GI, you know, there's so many scopes and so many other things that, you know, are sort of just, you know, out there, right, that we need to start bringing all of that in uh, and integrating it into the health record. Very good question. Yes. Uh, how do you treat the information for the, the patients? Is that confidential or the doctors have access to these? Yeah, good question. Um, so how do we treat the patient data that's captured? So, uh, you know, when, when a patient sees one of these doctors that's using Emma, I mean, it, it is confidential. They, it's just like if they were doing it on paper. So this is all for the doctor to see. When we analyze any of the data and we store the data is, you know, we have to de-identify it. So we have to remove any information about the, pers the patient's name, diagnosis, so we don't know you know, who, like for example, if we look at for a certain diagnosis like psoriasis, what prescriptions are being, um, you know, made by these doctors? I mean, we can't go back and say, oh, for this doctor, this is, or oh, for this patient, this patient was prescribed this medication. I mean, we can't, that's personal information. So it's all what we call the identified. Yeah. Question? Yeah, so, so the question is all around, you know, the security. I mean, obviously we're dealing with, you know, very sensitive data. Um, you know, how, do, how are we protecting against that? So, so think, and I'll give you examples. Um, you know, I'm not in the IT team and I'm sure they can provide all the, all the details. But for example, on the iPad, since 85% of our doctors use the iPad, almost 90%, um, you know, the, the information is not stored in the iPad. It's stored in the cloud. So let's say the doctor leaves the iPad, you know, somewhere or somebody else picks it up in the office. They cannot look at, you know, so-and-so was here and this is what the diagnosis. They cannot look at the data. It's all stored on the cloud. Um, so the cloud, so qu question about, you know, what is the cloud, you know, what does that mean? Can the, can clouds be hacked? Um, so, I mean, having been in IT for so long, you know, anything is possible, I guess. Uh, but there are, usually you guard yourself a, a against that through, you know, lots of, you know, process, procedures, governance, so that it doesn't happen. So we use, um, you know, Amazon Cloud, you know, um, and they have all kinds of, you know, firewalls and, and ways to, you know, guard. And, you know, and we, we, you know, we pay for extra services so that our stuff is even more segregated within the bigger cloud, uh, you know, universe out there. So, so there are, you know, technologies that, 
that we utilize and that the cloud providers utilize to keep you know, some of that, I mean, all of that away. Uh, I have not heard of any incident um, where the clouds have been hacked. Uh, but I mean, you, you are exposing yourself to putting something on the cloud, you know, anytime you put something that's outside of your, you know, it's not sitting on your desk or on a server uh, on premise, you know, you are sort of subject to anything could happen, but we do take precautions around that. Could, could you just give like a definition of the cloud? Because I know a lot of people use the term and I'm not really not sure what the cloud, the cloud. Really yeah. Is. So the cloud is really, um, you know, for those of you that may know how it was done before, you know, you used to buy servers and just put them, you know, if let's say you were a doctor's office, you would buy the server, keep it in the office, and all of the processing, whatever that you did, was done right there. So um, that's, that was how, you know, comp how processing was done. Um, that tends to be very costly, difficult to maintain, you know, and keep it up to date. So this idea of a cloud, um, which is really, you know, virtual, so it's a set of servers somewhere around the world that are all interconnected that allow companies to tap into so that um, they can do their processing there instead of, you know, at their, you know, inside their office. Uh, it just, and again, I'm simplifying it just because I know many of you may not be in technology, but it's just, you know, sort of virtual processing power that, you know, doesn't sit at your desk. It sits out there somewhere. It is, you know, it is secure, and there are lots of things that you can do to, not you, but, you know, the providers of cloud like Amazon, IBM, and others uh, can do to keep it secure so your data is not shared with others. Um, you know, you do, you do keep it, you know, you can select to have your data kept, obviously, you know, secure and isolated. Um, so I hope that that kind of helps. So it is sort of, you know, it's processing done somewhere else, not within, you know, your immediate environment. Yes, back all the way back there. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. Okay, so the question is around acquisitions. How do I view that at a strategic initiative? Um, so, so that is one way for us to acquire capability, skills, you know, market share, you know, even faster, right, than us building it ourselves. Um, so, but the trick with that is, you know, which one to acquire, you know, the assessment of which ones, you know, which ones make sense, um, and, you know, kind of scouting the market for, you know, which ones kind of fit our model, and not just from a technology perspective, but also from a cultural perspective, because, you know, when I was at IBM, we did lots of acquisitions, and, you know, sometimes the culture, if, if you don't have some, other than the technology roadmaps and all of that would, could have been great, but then there were clashes in the culture, and then, I mean, it just didn't, some of them did not work well, right? I mean, you gotta look at acquisitions beyond sort of just the technology, but really, you know, how, um, you know, what impact you will have in the marketplace, can you capture market share quickly, you know, uh, the skills that you're bringing on board, um, what growth uh, you can attain from those, from those companies so that, again, you're not building it yourself, but you're actually bringing it in-house. Um, so, um, so the two acquisitions, well, the one that was done back last year, I wasn't on board. This one, we're just closing. Um, so it's just very interesting to see them done end-to-end versus when I was at IBM, I would only see portions of acquisitions. So um, this is nice to see, this is what's so nice about smaller companies, you get to see sort of everything from beginning to end. So that's, that's a, great, a great thing for me, it's meant for me. All right, any other questions? Did I miss any, any hands? Yes. So the question is, who would own the data? Um, so we, you know, we basically own the data, um, the de-identified data. Um, so that's the data that a lot of the pharmaceuticals are interested in. The doctors are interested also in, in seeing how the data that we're accumulating helps them, right? So it's not just for the pharmas. Um, so for example, uh, we have a feature within Emma, it's called Ground Rounds, that uh, it allows you, we provide the doctors with, you know, this information around 
for a particular disease or diagnosis, what medications are being prescribed. And we break it down in, into three segments. We say, you know, for the doctors in your office, for psoriasis, they're prescribing these medications, and we'll list the top five or ten. For the doctors in your, net, in the, um, in your network, it could be, you know, multiple practices, you know, within, let's say, you know, um, it could be three or four practices. You can see the data that's being used, you know, can see the medications that are being prescribed by the doctors. And then you can also see the network of all the, the ones in the U.S., what all the other doctors that are using MR are, are prescribing. So we kind of give the doctors some information back, not just only for their practice, but the rest of, of the universe of EMMA, which is very helpful for them. And again, de-identified, you know, they don't know who's pre prescribing what. It's just, you know, general information that they can I use to help make their decisions. Yes? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, so the question is, are the patients told um, about EMMA and what it is? That's really at the doctor's discretion. Um, I mean, we do have a patient portal, I mean, but so do many other uh, companies have patient <coughs> portals where they can come in and fill out all the paperwork before they come into the office. So I, um, I'm not aware of, I mean, there may be some tech-savvy patients that want to know, like, you know, hey, what is this iPad and what is, you know, what is it that you're doing with an iPad versus just doing it on paper, but, um, you know, the patients are not, I mean, to them, you're seeing the doctor just like you were when it was all done by, by paper. Uh, this is just making the doctor more efficient, giving the doctor more time with the patient, more um, FaceTime, you know, with the patient and just being more accurate and capturing their information. So, yeah, the patients don't care. I think as long as, you know, they get you know, quality time with the doctor, I think that's really what, what's at the end. And they do sign, you know, I mean, what they do sign, you know, all the patient agreements that you sign when you see a doctor, so we're following all the same things. I mean, there's nothing here that, other than it's being stored somewhere else, you know, everything else is, you know, we have to protect it, because it's very confidential data. Yes, back there. Yep, so, so good question around really the cost of ownership, you know, f switching to, to our technology from whatever it is that they're using today. Um, so, you know, when we first started, a lot of the doctors were on paper, so I think that this, you know, the sort of what I call the cost of ownership and just the, the switching costs, you know, were sort of pretty obvious, right? Um, as far as just the benefit that they were getting from, you know, having to deal with lots of papers and doing billing and coding and all of that to just touching, you know, as you, I mean, I didn't uh, have the time to, to bring a demo, but, uh, you know, the way the application works is you just tap and go, right? Like the doctor will say, you know, I'm seeing this patient for psoriasis and all they're doing with their iPad is just touching and, and the application takes them through a workflow. Um, so there's not a lot of typing, um, so they can, quickly, you know, see a patient and get everything documented. Um, so, you know, so things that they have to consider um, are, you know, believe it or not, it's not so much a technology as at times, it's really the, you know, the change of, you know, trying to train, you know, training all of the office staff, the doctors um, to just use this new technology. I think that's really where, you know, a lot of the, the challenge comes in. You know, getting the technology in the office is, is quick. It's the training, it's, the, it's really the change, you know, managing the change in the office that takes a little bit of time. And we provide services, you know, we have online training, we do um, in-person training, we have great support so that, you know, we, we help the doctors through that change process. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about, it's a transformation, it's a change for them. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but, um, you know, it is a big, 
transformation for them. And it is, you know, th they do have to factor the cost of not just the technology, but the training um, to get all the staff using the, you know, the iPad, I mean, the, the EMMA application. How am I doing on timing? Um, we have <laughs> 10 minutes left. Okay, great. All right. Other questions? Yes. Okay, question is what advice would um, I offer to graduates and uh, to graduates and what um, I wish I could have known earlier in my career? Uh, let's see, so, um, so I would say a um, couple of things. You know, especially if, if you think you're gonna be in the technology space, um, like I, you know, that was really the industry I was in for, for so many years. Um, I mean, you get so carried away in the gee whiz of technology that you forget sort of what technology is here for. It's really to solve a business problem. So I would say, you know, just be aware, you know, very aware whether you're on the technology side or on the business side. You know, if you're on the business side, you want to know how does this technology help you, you know, at the end of the day, you know, be a better accountant or be a, you know, a better whatever. So, um, so really having that balance between you know, the technology and the business side because um, again, sometimes you, you know, technology is great and a lot of the new stuff that's coming out with, again, natural language processing, all kinds of things like that, you, know, you, you sort of get so wowed into that that you forget you know, what is it that this is being used for? Um, so that I would say would be one of the things keep, you know, um, sort of keep that in mind. The other thing is, um, and this is sort of just generic sort of career advice, um, you know, really develop your brand. I can't tell you how important it is, um, especially as you, you know, graduate and move on. You know, really, what are, what are you really good at? What is it that you want to do or enjoy doing? Um, for example, when I graduated from college, um, I actually became a programmer for IBM. So I was very technical. I mean, I went to college, you know, got a MIS degree, um, and I thought programming is it, right? Kind of like if you did technology, you did programming. And, you know, I must tell you, I, it was not my thing, right? I mean, I did it well, but um, actually my manager at the time came to me after I did it for about two or three years. Um, he said, you know, you're really good at people. Have you ever considered you know, being out more with, you know, clients um, and just kind of more being on the selling side, but you really have to understand technology. You can't just go sell something that you don't under, you know, you don't know what it is. So, um, so that kind of started my progression into really understanding, you know, what I really, I am good at, what I um, enjoy doing. And lo and behold, that kind of put me on a track of, you know, being in front of clients, being very much, um, the outside the box thinker because, you know, again, some of the experiences I had with technology roles like in research, I could go beyond sort of what's there today. So anything you can do, anything that helps you um, just get to know yourself and sort of who you are. Uh, and sometimes that just comes with experience, right? It's, I don't think there's a test or anything you can take, you know, personality test or anything like that. It's, it's just try different things. Um, you know, and the, I must have had, gosh, probably 13 jobs within IBM, different roles over my 20 plus years. Um, I tried everything, you know, marketing, consulting, um, you know, development, just, and that's when I started to say, you know, I'm not that, I'm more this, I really enjoy doing that. And that kind of got me on a path for the last 10 or 15 years. I said, you know, I really love being this entrepreneur and I want to stay there, and then every role that I would see, I would say, you know, if it has elements of that, then I'll go for it. If it doesn't, then I'm not, and that kind of kept me on, on that path. Great questions. Wonderful. Any other, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Have you, uh, now a question for you guys. Have, have you seen, are you seeing any doctors using Emma today, or the ones that Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so you'll be seeing, I mean, again, we have, for dermatology, we have over 
We're around 5,000 providers, so, so that's continuing to grow, and we have about 30% of the market, so that you'll be seeing a lot more of that. Yes? Oh, being a visionary, where do I see modernizing medicine? That's a great question. Um, I mean, if you talk to Dan, you know, this, uh, our CEO and, and Michael, Dr. Sherling, um, I mean, we're just so well positioned for growth and really capturing the specialty market space. Um, I mean, right now we're in eight specialties, you know, you know, who knows, we'll, we'll probably grow into more of that, uh, more specialties over time. Certainly the enterprise space, which is such a strategic area for us, uh, you know, I see ourselves, you know, being the front end to a lot of the, you know, the hospital systems, you know, when it comes to specialties. I see ourselves certainly being international. I mean, that's just a matter of time. It's not if, but when. Um, so, you know, again, I don't have a crystal ball, and, uh, but lots of, growth and potential, lots of partnerships. Um, you know, one of the things that you learn is that, you know, through acquisitions, through partnerships, that's where you gain momentum and really fuel your growth. So yes, you do it organically, but you also need a strategy around how you're gonna partner, how, um, you know, how are you gonna go through acquisitions as well. Is this public data or not? No, we're private, we're private. So you think we'll be talking to a machine for a diagnosis? Well, um, <laughs> so the question was, are we going to be talking to a machine for a diagnosis? I mean, again, I don't think we'll, you know, machines will never replace, you know, the human mind. I think that that is the, the ultimate quest, right? That's what scientists wrestle with. You know, will, will machines ever, and I know there's lots of sci-fi movies around, you know, machines taking over the world and all of that stuff. But you know the real scientists and the non-movie aspect of this is that is the quest. You know how far can we take, you know, computers and the machine learning to think like the human mind? But um, you know we're still. I don't know if we'll get there. I think you know our brain is so so wired in a way that <laughs> we'll see. But we'll get close. I mean I think we're certainly getting much closer. Um, to certainly where we were 10 years ago when I was sitting in that car. <laughs> well, I would like to thank Maria for being here with us tonight. I have to tell you that if you ask Dan about the question about where do you see yourself growing in 10 years, he'd probably give you a very different answer. Um, but I won't tell you what that answer is. Um, <laughs> and on behalf of the College of Business oh, at Florida Atlantic University, thank you. I would like to give you this certificate and a goodie bag. Wonderful. Uh, of FAU. Thank you. Uh,